Hello, this is John Gowlett. I'm an archaeologist specialising in human origins, working at the University of Liverpool and carrying out fieldwork in Africa, especially in Kenya. A year ago, in 2020, I participated in the Aikup Kenji Evolutionary Biology Conference at METU, giving a talk on the origins of human fire use. I was greatly inspired by the conference, the enthusiasm of its student organisers, and its value in explaining evolution. Now, after our difficult year of COVID, I congratulate the organisers on arranging this 2021 conference, and it's my pleasure to contribute this talk. In our research, we're interested in addressing major questions about how we came to be human and to have our present sophisticated abilities, such as practicing art. In the talk, I examine aspects of aesthetic origins and human sociality as highlighted by early technology and setting forward a hypothesis about factors which may have driven the emergence of aesthetic sense. The Achillean tradition, a focus of the talk, is actually the longest single cultural entity of the past, an adaptation lasting for more than 1.5 million years. Its tools were made largely by an earlier human species, Homo erectus, and tell us much about their capabilities. To set the context, let's look quickly at the framework of human evolution. In outline, we know that hominin ancestors diverged from the ancestors of chimpanzees and bonobos, our closest ape cousins, six to eight million years ago. We see these hominin ancestors early on as Ardipithecus, then as the Australopithecines, and eventually as our own genus Homo. Hominins live successfully in environments which required more varied diet than the apes have, and more elaborate food getting habits. They seem to have become successful rapid, rapidly and probably to have lived under very strong evolutionary pressures. We can see that within the last three million years, they developed stone tools and other material culture, culminating in uniquely human features such as language and art. And it's these which are in some broad sense the focus of the talk. Now we come to the Ashulean tradition. It follows the earliest stone tools of the old one and appears about 1.75 million years ago. Through more than one and a half million years, the Ashulean is linked by its characteristic stone tool form, its hand axes or bifaces, often regarded as the first tool showing real design form. The hand axes represent tool use as adaptation in one view, an adaptation successful over a very long period. They have been described many times. Here it's enough to recapitulate that they're generally large stone tools with average length 10 to 15 centimetres and a weight of about half a kilo. They're made to be approximately bilaterally symmetrical around a long axis. They have a major plane whose edges can form a working edge, sometimes sharp. They appear to be general purpose tools with occasional evidence actually indicating their use in butchery or woodworking. Ashulane hand axes have long provoked the thought that they might have something to do with aesthetics and perhaps the origins of art as well as with simple function. This idea is found in Schmidt's work in the 1930s, and then was taken up by Kenneth Oakley, Nick Toth, Jean-Marie Le Tonseret, Derek Hodgson, just as examples, and then Stephen Mythen's work also regarding it as the first aesthetic artifact. Most recently, Tony Boland and Tom Wynn organized an exhibition shown by Nasha Foundation in Dallas regarding uh, the hand axes as part of the first sculpture. The analysis of the modern concepts entailed in these inquiries is not altogether easy. 
a number of past analyses, however, divide the human world into major segments. For André Leroy Garand, these were technology, sociality, and aesthetics. Then for the American culturologist L.A. White, they were the technological, the sociological, and the ideological philosophical. Other authors, including Stephen Mython, have adopted somewhat similar schemes. Both genetic and fossil evidence suggest that the great apes and their deep sociality go back some 20 million years. So the social comes first. And we cannot explain everything new in our own lineage, Homo, except through changes in the nature and levels of sociality. Such changes, as widely agreed, come partly through language and associated rule systems. Where we cannot see language, we may see other signs of symbol systems or of other rule systems, as in the Asherlein hand axis, which we are considering. I'll argue in this talk that tests of appropriateness are an important part of making technology the second domain. Where these are done to shared standards, a toolmaker must be concerned with both how would others make this tool and how would others regard this tool. Here, the social and the technical are intertwined, levels of intentionality are involved, and judgments may be related to the aesthetic. At the very least, traditions entail shared values. Ashleyan bifaces provide one of the earliest examples of these principles as hard evidence. The aesthetic, the last of these categories, is not easily defined despite a long history and long history of study, but it would probably be widely accepted that it appears later than the social and technological domains. As a shorthand, it can be summarized. The essence of the aesthetic is that someone sees something or makes something, the experience of which gives pleasure, which may not be related to immediate functional needs or expression. That pleasure is perceived through mind, brain and body, so that for some authors, all human decisions are aesthetic, a view similar to Leroy Garand's concept of functional aesthetics, which can include all tools. Others argue that similar phenomena can also occur in other non-human animals, such as apes or some birds. To set up a starting position, it can be summarized that aesthetic studies fall within both philosophy and psychology. My diagram is intended to show these two aspects and also their two-way relationship with the evolutionary past. The ideas of aesthetics relative to the Acherleian and its hand axis can be approached in two quite different ways. In the first, archaeologists or other scholars make claims that bifaces show signs of early aesthetic sense. Essentially, they are envisaging the modern Western aesthetic sense and testing the past record for its presence or absence. Alternatively, we could aim to determine what factors in the course of human evolution might have led to something like an aesthetic sense to develop and could consider in particular whether Acherlein bifaces cast some light on this. I prefer the second approach, as it attempts not to project the ideas of Western art aesthetics, but rather to evaluate the evidence in its own right. Let's turn now to evidence that scholars have seen as special in hand axes. The symmetry is the most obvious, but while appreciating it, we can also be cautious about its significance. It may send a message, as many have thought, that someone can make a very fine object. 
but it can also be functionally desirable. It gives good balance. Any irregularity risks leading to a functional deficit in the tool. And in modern economic studies, comfort in the use of tools is seen as very important. On occasion, hand axes seem to have been made special in a different way. That is, they seem to have been made around a particular fossil, or in other cases, even around a hole in a piece of stone. So in this figure, we see a fossil sea urchin at the centre of a hand axe, first noticed by Kenneth Oakley. And Oakley pointed out two or three other examples where fossil shells have been found at the centre in a similar way. And there's particular interest there that we know that shells become important later in human evolution when, for example, they're often used in beads. The only difficulty with this idea is that such hand axes are so rare, perhaps only about three in 10,000, that you could easily argue that this is happening just by chance. In some earlier work, I found that hand axes at Kilombi in Kenya and other sites showed that the makers had an accurate ability to transform, that is, to create similar complex output at different scales, making smaller and larger hand axes in very similar form. This scaling is often overlooked. Many workers start by standardizing size in their analyses. But it is really unequaled as a measure of cognitive and practical abilities. The physicist Richard Feynman also pointed out the importance of scaling in mathematics. Amongst other things, scaling, size change in tools, necessitates the ability to manage proportion, something that we might regard as an advanced ability. Another specialness has been noted in the proportions of hand axes, especially their shape in plan view. It's been noticed by several authors that the average shape of a hand axe has this special ratio of 0.61, otherwise called golden section. Golden section occurs in, for example, classical architecture, or even uh, in the A series of note paper. So if you take a piece of A4 paper and fold it in half, it will make A5, and you can fold that to make A6 and so on. And the proportion is always maintained. But if we take a whole series of hand axes, such as from Kilombi here, several hundred in total, then we will find that there is actually a shape shift from the smallest to the largest hand axis. The smallest ones will actually have a proportion of about 0.75 in breadth and length. That is about three to four. The longest ones will be much more elongated and their ratio of breadth to length can even be 0.50, that is about two to one. So what we're seeing here is more a capability of the makers to change the shape for different sizes. And it seems hard to argue that overall, they have a particular target in mind, this special proportion of 0.61. Even so, it's remarkable that when large sets of hand axes are studied in different parts of the world, this ratio does tend to recur as the grand mean. Another example of this point comes from the million year old site of Kariandusi in Kenya. Here, some of the hand axes are made of the volcanic glass obsidian, a very fine material, and others are made of a local lava. They're found in different places. The larger lava biofaces 
are somewhat elongate, relatively narrow, with a breadth length proportion of about 0.58. The obsidian bifaces are somewhat shorter and they're broader in proportion with a mean of about 0.64. So one might think that the people have different design goals for these two sets of bifaces. But if we plot them together, we find the same sort of size shape shift that is present at Kilombi. And as you see here, together they make one smooth series. And again, that value of a grand mean of about 0.61 emerges, although it looks quite clear that it's not the specific design goal either for people who are making the smaller obsidian hand axes or for the people, perhaps the same people, making the larger lava bifaces. So early tools such as hand axes may have special characteristics, but we have to be somewhat cautious in interpreting them. Here I'll put the main argument of this talk aiming for a more broadly based social model. In most species, most perception is about seeking out and reacting to external information so as to make responses. These behavioral responses involve actions and interactions with inanimate and animate objects. They're taken a whole stage further when the species interacts with the world not just through immediate movements of self, but through the making and use of artifacts. Artifacts impart a new level of adaptation, both animal and human. Most fundamentally, all artifacts are multivariate, involving numbers of variables, such as length, breadth, thickness, balance point, and so on, each of which places demands on the maker, multivariate demands. How do you get all these things right? So complex artifacts can be made only through instruction sets, which entail the transfer or reworking of three-dimensional constructs from within the brain out into the external world. These implemented through routines of shaping or assembly. The slide shows some of the variables involved in the making of hand axes. These include length, breadth, thickness, but all the other aspects that relate to the shape of the piece and its performance. Individual variables can be influenced by culture and or ergonomics, practical needs. An important element is balance point. That's one variable. It varies according to the work that a tool will do. In hand axes, we find that it's much the same as in modern screwdrivers, even though one rotates and the other must not rotate. But in modern chisels, and in some past heavy hand axes, the balance point is further forward because they do heavier work. The important point is that there is a pressure for the maker to know this and to get it right. The next slide gives some more illustrations of the way that variables were carefully handled. And particularly, they cast light not just on symmetry, but on the way that the early makers were able to do symmetry breaking. Now, symmetry breaking is a very slight asymmetry in this case imposed on the overall symmetry. It's clear in the hand axe on the left where the left-hand margin is curved and the right-hand margin is straight, perhaps because they were intended to have slightly different functions. You can see the same features in the next hand axe in the centre, just very slightly readjusted. And then on the one on the right, also from Kilombi, you can see something that looks quite different. The bottom part of the tool is symmetrical and the top part is very clearly angled. But actually, you can also relate these to the tools further to the left, in that the left-hand margin of the tool has a long sweeping curve, and the 
angled part is straight, um, resembling the straight parts of the other hand axes. So it's as if the makers have the ability to hold parts of the tool in a particular form, but to be able to morph others. And that is really an indication of very sophisticated abilities. In this slide, we can see the angling of the ends of cleavers, versions of hand axes with a transverse edge. At left is a cleaver from Carrion Ducey. Note the bottom half is like a hand axe and the top half different. Next comes a very strongly angled hand axe from Kilombi, made like a cleaver. Then also from Kilombi comes a very symmetrical cleaver. At the right, the outline of one is placed on the other, and you can see that they are almost identical through 60% of the length. The message is that Homo erectus of a million years ago could manipulate all the variables and morph them as necessary. Finally, as examples from Kilombi, here at the top, a most symmetrical hand axe on the left and one of the most asymmetrical on the right. But the left hand edge of each has a very similar curve. They have features in common. Below, there are three views of another specimen. It looks perhaps unfinished. On the left, you can see how with the last corner trimmed, it would have symmetry. But inspection of it at centre shows that the corner could easily have been finished. So the maker chose to leave it, perhaps because, see on the right, this would provide a longer symmetrical working edge. In effect, a symmetry within the asymmetry. Again, the practical needs encourage the maker to make effective judgments about several variables that are in play. And again, we're seeing evidence that humans, early humans, had these capabilities very long ago. We've seen flexibility that Ashleyan toolmakers of a million years ago had brains and minds which allowed reworking of component ideas in various forms. In each case, the completion judgments would range across the variables and stages of manufacture. They also became capable of a transfer of ideas, for example, between materials. Rare preservation of wood at Calambo Falls in Zambia helps us see this transferability between wood and stone around half a million years ago. Various factors may also push towards separation of these completion judgments from the immediate functional needs. On the large landscapes used by hominins, operational chains of making and using tools become necessarily broken or segmented, interspersed with other threads of social and subsistence activity. The next linkage is that this potential separation of appropriateness judgments and function could easily be enhanced through the presence of language so that a meaning could be added to a tool quite separate from its obvious function. The fossils and holes in hand axes may attest to this. Such evidence does not definitely indicate language, but the artifacts remain our hardest evidence of ideas. The crux is that the maker constructs an artifact within a tradition and judges its appropriateness, both in relation to individual experience and in relation to group practices. In effect, taking into account the opinions of others. This business of considering how others would judge an artifact appears to be at the heart of modern aesthetics as a shared phenomenon. How would these components be driven further towards aesthetics? 
one can try to map out these key developments as part of the evolutionary process in the emergence of HOMO. In overview, the schematic diagrams here set forward first the sequence of sociality, technology, and then of aesthetics. Then the importance of the lighting up of intentionality, with intentionality, a complex idea, being in this sense essentially the ability to think about what others think. The next model diagram highlights beyond the somewhat linear development of technology and aesthetics, the great importance of interactions in the processes. Through time, there are many developments in evolution in human society, which must have happened, even though sometimes we can only see them dimly. And in these, we can ask what drives the change what drives the loops? And overall, the answer must be that there's a selection pressure for managing complexity with very high concentration levels needed, social, technological, and aesthetic. Let's return now to the broader issues of how we perceive aesthetics. This talk has attempted to show how an aesthetic sense might emerge related to the social and technological, but is it consistent with modern views of the aesthetic? Here, there are almost as many views as for definitions of culture. The simple tripartite or three-part diagram shown earlier can be elaborated to include at least double branches. The psychology runs in near continuum from the experimental with studies of perception to neuroscience with its studies of brain circuitry. Philosophical discussions divide at least into those aligning with Western art and those that are more craft and skill based. As the anthropologist Gellner argued, the evolutionary record is lived once for itself and again for us. The ideas set out here start from this essence. Satisfactory completion of externalized tasks requires appropriateness judgments. The role of these is greatly enhanced for animals that manufacture artifacts. All tools are multivariate, but in hominin lineages, selective pressures for better tools led them to be increasingly so, and hence to impose multivariate judgments with high cognitive loads. These developments, which we can see developing from old one to a Chilean through two million years, happened in a deeply social context in which the aspect of intentionality is important in making complex judgments. The maker must weigh personal experience in relation to group knowledge with the consideration of what others think. In conclusion, the emergence of aesthetics is a complex field, which we only partly understand, but it is a fundamental aspect of human evolution. Functional aesthetics embraces almost everything that we make. The preconditions can be traced deep into human origins. Aesthetic sense entails appreciation of what is appropriate, in the making of material culture, an appreciation that is socially mediated. So finally, aesthetic experience has meaning only in a social context of shared human values. It's not in itself art, but early artifacts show how it may have been enhanced and have had adaptive value. The social dimension with high levels of intentionality is a necessity complementary to functional needs for the aesthetic to arise in respect of technology. Acknowledgements. Well, thanks especially to the organizers of the METU Evolutionary Biology Conference, which is a splendid memorial to Aikut Kense and also has an enormous importance in projecting academic knowledge. My thanks also to my many colleagues, some mentioned here 
and to those who, who have uh, allowed our work in Kenya and given so much help. Thank you.